And now Charlie's going to do the howl, which is really, I'm sure, what you're all here for. <laughs> and uh, to do that, and uh, somewhat briefly, uh, until recently, the prevailing technology constrained small press possibilities with systems that were created by larger companies to serve their interests, be that methods of connecting to potential authors or the production, distribution, and marketing of books. The recent transformations in publishing, though, have facilitated our development, along with that of many other small presses, allowing us either to bypass these constraints or at least reduce their strength. These changes are dramatic. Foremost, of course, is the internet, giving us easy access to potential authors on the one side and the ability to market on the other. We love bookstores. We are, of course, happy to have bookstores carry our books, but they are no longer necessary to our operations. Customers can reach us directly at our website, as they can our authors at theirs, or through Amazon and the like. The other crucial innovation for us is print-on-demand technology. Our access is easy through our arrangement with Lightning Source, Ingram's printing arm. They now carry some 6 million titles, adding 500 every day. Despite this enormous size, we can upload an entire manuscript while eating dinner and have the resulting books in whatever quantity we wish at our door the following week or sent directly to customers anywhere in the country within the same time frame or with a little more time anywhere in the world. If happily we find that we need more copies, they can, be, they can be obtained just as quickly. If, God forbid, we later find a glaring mistake, new corrected copies can be produced with minimal additional cost. Combined, these innovations make possible a much more environmentally responsible operation and greatly reduce the necessary capital investment. The alternative traditional mode of production and distribution invariably means the printing of large numbers of books that will never be sold and eventually end up in the landfill. By one estimate, 40% of books produced are never sold. Bookstores will display most books for only a short period. We can pay to have them shipped back to us, but they will not necessarily be in resellable condition. This is waste, both of material and of investment. Bookstores, in fact, return a third of their hardcovers, a quarter of their paperbacks, between 65 to 90 percent of these returns are destroyed. There's another dimension to this, one very important for writers. Under the traditional mode, the usual book has a short life in the bookstore, often for no more than four months. Bookstore shelf space is finite, as is publisher catalogs and warehouse space. With print-on-demand, however, the imperative for quick sales collapses. Books can have a long life. We as publishers are committed to each, for the, each of their lives for the duration. Uh, this is true not just for our anthologies, but also our single authored books. We contract with authors for five years so they do not feel indentured to us forever. At that point, we can recommit to each other for another five years. It's in our interest to do so. That means that it is also in our interest to treat our authors kindly so that they would want to renew the contract. On the other hand, should they be able now to, to now place that book with a larger commercial publisher, we regard that as not only a win for the author, but for us as well. More than anything else, we ourselves are writers. Not only is it natural for us to treat <coughs> our writers as we want to be treated as writers, but it also feels as publishers that this is just sound policy. There's a downside here as well, though, and that is that the same technology means books can just as easily be resold and resold through the internet. The customer gets our book, but we get no income. Great for them, definitely bad for us. This brings us more directly to the financial side of our operation. We originally explored incorporation as a nonprofit, since profit making was not our primary objective. And being realists, we didn't expect to be, make, to be making a lot. However, it soon became clear that under IRS regulations, instead of producing books, we would be spending too much of our time trying to raise funds from other people to finance what we wanted to do. So we instead incorporated as a for-profit corporation, more specifically an S-Corps, which effectively joins the press for tax purposes to our own individual returns. So far, most of our books have paid their own way, but that does not count the underlying infrastructure or the considerable amount of time that we put into the press as publishers and editors. That is, our press is subsidized by our own unpaid labor. 
The fact is that outside of the successful book at commercial presses, much publishing is subsidized in one form or another. As examples, the commercial book that does not earn back the writer's advance, nonprofit publishers through grants and donations, university presses using MFA students for production work, and more loosely, <coughs> academic publishers with automatic sales to research libraries prior to any reviews and with generous editorial standards. And then there's the explosion of self-publishing, either in print or e-books. Combined with the collapse of book reviewing at newspapers and magazines, the issue of assessing credibility standards is now in a state of turmoil. Anyone with something to say and a relatively small amount of money can now publish and market. Within this new world, it is our objective of Wise Enough Press to produce books that are professionally credible, economically viable, ecologically responsible, and that build a community in the process. And uh, we would now be very happy to take your questions. Um, I think, you know, one of the really nice things about smaller press is that you've been talking about, they can have a real identity and mission and sort of character that in some sense feels like it's getting lost in, in larger publishing as, you know, they become conglomerates. Um, to that end, how do writers find you and how do you find writers to kind of fit your philosophy or character? And then is there anything you recommend um, for the writers here who are interested in looking at other small presses in terms of resources and how to find you know, other small presses that might be a good match for their own work. I can answer that because I found them. Um, they had an ad in Poets and Writers called the submissions, and I sent in a piece and they accepted it. And then I think you let me know when you had another anthology if I wanted to submit something. But basically there, were, there was always an ad, I think, in Poets and Writers. So anybody who read that magazine could see that ad as Sure, that was my experience also. When I first came across Wise Enough Press, they were making a call for different submissions to their anthologies. And I honestly just kind of kept in contact with them. I was always kind of dipping in and out of a website, trying to see if they had any more calls for submissions. They were very consistent and always updating poets and writers for their most current anthology calls for submissions and such too. But yeah, also, they just immediately sparked my interest, and I believe it was over a period of maybe three years that I continuously just kind of kept in touch to see what they were up to. And so then, uh, taking that and then moving to the second part of your question, is that that's been e uh, much easier than the other side of the marketing. It's much easier to communicate, get in contact with uh, authors, and keep that connection going through things like uh, Poets and Writers and Duotro. There's several different places like this where then those of you who are writers and would like to be uh, seeing your work um, considered and published is to regularly check in with those sources. Uh, you know, go over to the library and look at the current issue of Poets and Writers or I can do it all online and, and see what advertisements are there. Uh, there are submission calls all the time. Uh, there are several different listservs that you can get on and we've used those as well. Uh, and uh, for our experience, uh, what we've also found is it very much growing, that as we become better known among writers, then when we have a submission call, then they will also be distributing it to their networks. And so uh, we, we, get, uh, we get a lot of really good submissions for our anthologies, far more than, than we could possibly utilize. And I, I think that one thing that helps, though, is to think of a relationship, okay? That um, that's why I was always intrigued by this word honored when people sent it, because many people are, are very self-absorbed and they're, all they want is something to put on their beta. They often don't even look at the books. They don't care about the press or what the publication is. That just is something that'll help them for tenure or whatever. And so they were surprised. They were surprised into appreciation because these are very solid books. And I'm, but it was such an interesting word, honored. Um, it's not, not one <laughs> that you always encounter. And I thought that was interesting. You know? uh, so I think that you have to think of it as a relationship. You know, publishing is changing a lot. You get to choose the presses you submit to. You get to encourage the ones who speak to you. 
our, our approach it speaks to some people a lot. And they'll write and just say, we just love your website. It talks about writing in a way that makes sense to me. And if it doesn't, there's no reason to do it. Well, you know, we, are, we're, we do topics, so if you're interested in that topic. But some people are just interested in our approach in general, and those are the ones who continue. And we found for the collective that that process of referring people through several anthologies uh, is a very good one for us to get a sense of whether that person truly is interested in other writers as well as themselves, or is really interested in, in reaching other people. And I just feel in the long run, to find that place that makes you generous, that makes you want to help them, and feel that you're really seen and heard by them. We are very considerate of writers. Uh, we write, as somebody said, one of the, the nicest rejection letters in the world. <laughs> and we do, because I'm a writer. And um, I want somebody, you know, I work hard on what I write. I want to feel that somebody read it carefully and thought about it. And I want writers to send to us work they care about, that they invested in, and that it matters to them as well, because it's our time. We're, you know, we're very skilled. We're gi giving that time, and we want people who can see that, so that that is a healthy relationship. And that's what I'm saying. And I can say this because I am a writer. But there's something about sitting alone in a room where you can get sort of grandiose in your mind about what the world <laughs> owes you as a writer. Like, and so one of the questions I have is, why should somebody publish? I'm sorry if that upsets you, but why should somebody publish you? Why should they publish your book? And think about that. It's a good question. Because I would say what we want is really solid literary quality, OK? And we want simple self, you know, sufficiency economically. Um, but I want lasting relationships. I want to feel that those books are really connecting with other people, and those people are connecting with me and with us. And that's our reward. So if we publish something and that person just goes on a narcissistic surge, I feel like a total failure. You know, we chose wrongly in that case, because that's not what we want. We want people who write out of life, you know, that life is tough, and we write to understand it, and we want to share that with people who have a need to understand it, they can use those books they may not be able to write, that they can recognize a voice that makes their world larger. So I think that, and there are other presses. If you want fame, you go to the presses that do that. If you want fortune, you go to the presses that do that. But make your choices coherent. And that's why I was saying on the back, what does success in writing mean to you? Go there, you know. Don't try and, you know, if, if, if literary, um, merit is yours and you go to a trade publisher who's only interested in um, and is going to have you edit that back to be something that's publishable but not what you wanted, don't do that You know, if, if your reward is the other. And what I think we're saying also is that because of the way publishing is changing, nobody's making a lot of money. You get a lot of choices about how to do things in a way that is coherent for you, that can still are sustainable. They're not going to make you rich. I don't know how many of you expect to make a living writing. Can people raise their hands? Who, who, expect, who expects here? Oh, bless you. <laughs> Come join us. <laughs> no. um, OK, so you're not expecting that. Just be really honored what you are expecting and be true to it. That's, 